good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, the birthday and the pastor appreciation, and I uh, appreciate that. Cancel, cancel. Um, <clears throat> I want to start this morning, I want to read a little bit of scripture out of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2. The word that I, Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for this day and this opportunity, Lord, to be here. We just ask you to just bless this service and this word, Lord God. Let your Holy Spirit just teach us and guide us today, uh, instilling within us the, the word of God and its, its truth. Lord God, we just, uh, we just come to you in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So this set of scriptures, what a, what a day it describes, right? And um, the day hasn't truly come yet, has it? We're not giving up all wars, the fighting wars today. There's always been wars, it seems, on this earth. Nations aren't getting along. Don't let the Word of God lead them. They let their passions, their hatreds, their anger, their jealousy, their bitterness, their, their desire for wealth and power and control is what leads the nations of the world today. So this day hasn't come yet, but this is a set of scriptures that is describing what will be. It's describing what will be. It's describing what is talked about in Revelation, the new heaven and the new earth. It's describing what life, our existence will be like for Christians, for those that turn upon the Lord, that, that take up His name and, and call upon Him for salvation. It's describing that eternity with Him. It's a promise of the wonders of following the Messiah. It's a promise of all that bow knee to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And, and what a beautiful promise it is. But they, we haven't seen it yet. And how long ago did Isaiah pen those words? And in, upon that beautiful set of Scriptures describing what Revelations calls the new heaven and new earth and a, a new, uh, new reality for us. After that, he goes into verse 6. And I want to read that now. For you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east and of foreign, uh, fortune tellers like the Philistines, and they strike hands with the children of foreigners. Their land is filled with silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land was filled with horses, and there was no end to their chariots. Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. So man is humbled, and each one is brought low. Do not forgive them. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of His majesty. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the lofty pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up, and against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, and against all the uplifted hills, against every high tower, and against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, 
and against all the beautiful craft and the haughtiness of man shall be humbled and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day and the idols shall utterly pass away and the people shall enter the caves of the rocks and holes of the ground from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty when he rises to terrify the earth. In that day, mankind will cast away their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship, to, to the moles and to the bats, to enter the cave, caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the, uh, clefts of the cliffs from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty when he rises to terrify the earth. Stop regarding man in whose nostril is breath, for of what account is he? What an interesting set of scriptures. He immediately changes from the first verses of this chapter where he spoke of the glorious, the glorious kingdom of God without wars, where He rules, where all knees bow to Him, where all laws come for Him, when no nation is at war, when no people are in sorrow, when no, nothing but perfectness. And then He goes right into this set of Scriptures, talking about the terror of the Lord. See, that great day of the Lord that notable day of the Lord. That day, that day in the future when this earth come to its conclusion. And, and theologians have been arguing about when that day is forever. Uh, it's not just in our time that, that we've had uh, preachers say that the world was ending. It's been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Preachers have been saying the world's coming to an end. The world's... And, and giving dates and giving time frames and telling them it's going to happen in your lifetime. And they've been saying that for hundreds of years. And guess what? Every one of them has been wrong so far. The other ones aren't wrong are the ones that have still predicted something here in, in the future. So man does not know. Scripture's clear. We don't know when that final day is. We don't know when God is going to do away with this existence of heaven and earth when this existence of, of man and the turmoil of this earth. We don't know when the Lord is going to do away with that. And anyone who claims they know is false. Because God is clear, no man knows. And yet, preachers throughout the generations have continued to say that. Now, I'm not here to talk about that so much as to say that notable day of the Lord, that day of the Lord is both fantastic and horrible. It is both spectacular and terrifying. These two sets of scriptures are describing the same events. For those that trust God, for those that rely upon Him, for those that have given their lives to Christ, the first five scriptures are for us. I want you to keep in mind the rest of what I read is for those that have rejected Christ in that day. And while we are looking forward to that time when we are in the kingdom of God, when we are within that holy new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth, when God is, is, is known to reign supreme, he reigns supreme now, but so many people reject that. But when every knee is bowed because they've come face to face with the truth of reality that Jesus Christ is Lord of all things, all times, all places, all powers, all authorities, that there will be people that are subject to the second half of what I read. I love the way the verse says, in, in the words were used a couple different places within this text I read. From before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of His majesty. 
God doesn't come down in this time at the end of times in like a scary outfit like on Halloween to scare people. In the same sentence, it talks about the terror of the Lord and how they turn from and run from and cower before the splendor of His majesty. To be unsaved and to come into the presence of the splendor of His majesty has got to be a truly terrifying event. Because it is in that moment when you have spent your life rejecting Jesus and you come to that place where you now are in the presence of that spectacular majesty of God, then your darkness is revealed. Your sins come to light. You see the vileness of your ways. You see what your rejection of Christ has cost you. You see that all beauty, all love, all things that are good come from God. And it's terrifying in ways I don't think we comprehend to come to the truth and to fully grasp what it is to come before the presence of God without the blood of Christ to purify us. I will never know that because I am clinging to the cross with every piece of energy I've got. I will never know what that terror feels like because I am never far from the cross. I am there. I'm counting. That's my only hope. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ. I will never know this terror. But there are people on that day. There are people when I meet my Savior and bow down and rejoice and understand so much more about His beauty, His splendor, His majesty, His greatness. When so many mysteries are revealed to me, and that day when it's joyful for me, there will be others who have come before Christ and learned the opposite. Now, I, don't, I, I am not the type of Christian that really believes that the second coming of Christ is going to be in my age, in my time, in my life. I don't, I don't believe that. I've talked to many Christians over the years who were convinced that Jesus was coming within their lifetime. And I'd say, I don't think so. And it's, uh, so far, a lot of them have already died in, without the second coming of Christ. So I've been right so far, you know, but I'm, I'm humble in that, you know, I, I'm okay if I'm wrong, too, you know. And I'm okay if I'm wrong, if, if he does come in my lifetime, I'm okay with that, but but I'm going to talk about some scriptures that want to give us a different think about, thinking about that. I just described to you the splendor of what it is for Christians on that day, whether it's tomorrow or whether it's a thousand years from now, but I've also described for you the terror of the unsaved on that day. Do you have any compassion in your heart for those people? Do you have any compassion in your heart for those people that will, when they see Christ for the first time, whether it's the end times or whether it's the day they die and there is terror at what's revealed to them? The terror of knowing that they're going to live eternity separated from God because that's what they chose. No one that wants to be with Jesus for eternity is rejected. That's what salvation is. Understanding He's our Lord and Savior. I want to be with Jesus for eternity. I'm, I love Him. I'm going to do what I can uh, to please Him because I love Him. I love Him because He first loved me. He died for my sins. I want to be with Him for eternity. Am I perfect? No, I fail along the way. But it never takes away the fact that I want to be with Him for eternity. And that's where my heart is. See, nobody, nobody with that kind of heart that wants to be with Jesus, that loves Him, isn't going to make it to heaven. It's the people that say, I don't want you in my life. Don't tell me what to do. I'll do my own thing. Oh yeah, I can, I'm okay with these parts of the Bible, but not this part. Just keep that for yourself. 
The people that want to reject him and seclude him and compartmentalize him to say, you can, be, you can be Lord of this part of my life, but not this part. People that don't want to, these are the people at risk. And for them, when they meet Jesus on that day of their death, it's t- going to be terrifying. Do you have any compassion for them? Let me read again out of Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5 says in verse 1, Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen no more to rise is the virgin Israel, forsaken on her land with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, The city that went out a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which went out a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. So here we have a section of verse where God is warning the house of Israel. You've fallen. You're worshiping false idols. You've turned against me. You you're, have enmity toward me. You hate me. You want to claim that you're my chosen people, but your lives don't reflect it. You're living as if you don't care. So many Christians want to say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but like Israel in that day, they're, they're saying they claim it, but they're not living it. And if you love God, you're living it. And so, he's warning them, and he tells them, seek me and live. Seek me. And nobody that seeks God, that seeks the truth, is rejected by God. Seeking Him. The, I, I, the, the, one of the greatest stories and the greatest stories of hope is the thief on the cross. He had a, how, how much time did he seek God? <laughs> he didn't seek Him very long. Just remember me. Remember me. And Jesus told him, on this day, you'll be with me in paradise. There was not a lot of seeking going on. It was quick. It, was, now, it doesn't take much. But it takes truth. And there was truth in the man's heart as he hung there. But if that man could have come down off his cross and walked a life, he would have been one living for Jesus. Because it was truth that he said, that he spoke, when he just said, remember me. Because he knew who to call on. What is, you know, you hear all these prayers of salvation, you know. We, we get, you get a little pamphlet, you get a little skin. This is how you lead, pray with somebody to lead, them to lead them to Jesus, you know, and you repeat after me type things. Okay, that's great. It's all about the heart. The thief on the cross didn't repeat anything. He didn't have a magical prayer. It was about his heart. It wasn't the words he said. Jesus measured his heart. A heart that loved Jesus, that counted upon Jesus, that knew that's where his salvation was. And so, here in this chapter of Amos, chapter 5, it's talking about the fallen Israel. Just seek me. Seek me and live. And if you drop down to 18 of that same chapter of Amos. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. It's a terrifying day. Or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. See, the people of Israel, they were confused about the day of the Lord. They read the things and they heard the things that Isaiah said in the first part of what we read. See, I'm tying this together. Hang with me. They, they, they read the first five verses of the promise of that day of the Lord when all nations will bow down to the Messiah, when all kingdoms will be ruled by the Messiah. They look upon that and they say, oh, we want that, we want that, we want that. And yet they were living in sin. Because they missed part of it. They thought because they were, God, they were Israel, God's chosen people, that's all it took. And they were in like Flint. Man, I show up at church every Sunday. I'm in. The 
It doesn't work that way. Many who are in churches today will not be in heaven, and many who aren't in churches will be. It is a state of the heart. It is not an attendance record. Now, the obedient Christian will attend church. No doubt about that. Because they, they, they crave the fellowship of other Christians. Like-minded people gather together grow stronger in their, in their thoughts and their ideas. That's why we congregate together to grow stronger. That's why we relate with one another. That we build friendships and, and trust amongst one another. That we can, because if we, if we make friends of, of the world, we begin to do the worldly things. And we make friends of Christians, we do Christian things. Like potlucks. You know, that's, I think that's somewhere uh, in, in Scripture. Have many potlucks. It seems like that's... But, but you see, that's, that's the kind of thing. Those are good. It's good for Christians to hang out together. But you see, Amos is warning them, you're calling on the name of the, you're calling for the day of the Lord, and yet you are not right with him. Get right with him. Because even if the day of the Lord doesn't come for this entire universe, your day may come. Seek me and live. There's not a better, better piece of advice in all of Scripture than what Amos penned right there. Seek me and live. Right from the words of God, he wrote that. A quote from God. Seek me and live. Seek me, seek me, seek me. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. It is both a terrifying, and a glorious day. And again I ask, is there any compassion for those who would be lost forever on that day? In Second Peter, chapter 3, verse 9, it says there, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise. And this is one of the points, main points I want to make for you this morning on this. Why is Jeff talking about this? Because he's not telling us the day of the Lord's right around the corner. So why is he talking about this today? The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise if some count slowness. Because we know that, right? A, a, a day for the Lord is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. Time is there. God created time, first off. If there was no universe, there would be no time. He created it. It's part of this universe. He's not confined by this universe. He's, not, he's the creator of it. He's the creator of time. So for him, time is, is not... That's why he knows everything. He's not bound by time. That's why he knows the beginning from the ending. That's why he's always been. He's not bound by time. He created it. That's a little bit of Christian physics, but it's the reality. If this universe wasn't here, there is no time, nothing to measure. And you can't measure God. He is not bound by time. He cannot be measured. So having that said, he said, he is not slow. And you understand now why. It says, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And I, I had a Christian a few years back tell me, Oh, yeah, I'm praying every day for Jesus to come. I'm praying that Jesus come. I said, well, I don't think he's coming right now. I said, I, I, and I don't want to pray that he comes right now. Because I'm praying then that so many lives would be lost. So many lives would be lost. If Jesus came today, how many people do you know that you work with, that you interact with, friends or even relatives, would be lost? Because they haven't accepted Christ. If He came today, in this moment, how many people would be lost? What if He had come 200 years ago when some preacher in Tennessee decided Jesus was coming? I wouldn't even have got a chance. Every one of those people that have been predicting the end of the world 
And Christians have been doing it since, I don't know, a hundred years after Jesus died at least, have been saying that God's, Jesus is coming in our age and we're in, it, I wouldn't be here. I'm glad they were all wrong. I am glad that they were all wrong or I would not even have existed to find myself having the opportunity to accept Jesus and go to heaven. I'm glad He didn't come yesterday. Because if He had, I know people that I care about that would be lost. And I still want to pray for them. I still want to get a chance to, to, to maybe show them the light of Christ, to witness to them. I don't, I don't want to pray people into hell. And so I said this to this person. I said, well, oh yeah, but, you know, hey, I, 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 since I was young, and I realized I was not perfect. And so, I think I was about 37 when I learned that. <laughs> that was, when I was young, and I realized I was not perfect. And, and, I, and at the point in time in my life when I cared, you know, at that point when you cared that you're disappointing God, when you know you're doing things and you're disappointing, at that point, I would sometimes, I would sometimes pray, and say, God, why don't you just make me perfect so I don't have to do this stuff? Why don't you just make it so I don't want to do this stuff? You know? So in a sense, I, I, was, I wanted that state of being when there is no more sin. I look forward to that. When there is no more sin, there is no more temptation. When I fully understand, or at least enough understanding of the love and the mercy and the grace of God that, that the thought of sin would never even come to our hearts and minds any longer. When I, I, I can trust everybody, I never have to worry, you know, I don't know if there'll be car salesmen in heaven, but if there are, they'll never cheat us. And we all have unlimited credit, so, you know, what's the difference anyway, right? But, you know, humorously, but you see, I, I, and a part of me longs for that time of perfection. But do I want to pray a prayer today that prevents... That that's, if God answered it the way I wanted it, I would be choosing who goes to heaven or not because based on when I want my desire of Him to come again to happen. Are you following me? Because that's what this Scripture is talking about. God is not slow to fulfill His promise that He's coming soon, right? All through Scripture it says He's coming soon. He's coming soon. He's not slow as some would count slowness. Human beings count, if it's not now, it's slow. I remember when the microwave was amazing. Now I'm sitting there like, i got to wait another 30 seconds. Remember when, because I, mean, I was alive before microwaves, right? And you had to cook everything on the stove, right? And, and it was really, well, I remember when I was a little kid, I'd get a, get a long fork and I'd kind of cook a hot dog over the flames on the gas stove. Well, I was really disappointed when we, what's this thing? And there's no, no fire? It's an electric stove? I was confused. That was like, I didn't know what to do. So then you had to boil a hot dog. Well, that seems weird. But then the microwave come out, and you could radiate the thing into edibility. And, you know, it would be a minute and 30 seconds, and you, boom, you know, the older, you'd get a hot dog, and it was hot. It was all crinkled up and weird. But, you know, I was, I was a teenager. I didn't mind the crinkled up weird hot dog. Squirt some ketchup and mustard on there and eat that thing on a piece of uh, bread. You know? We want it fast, but nowadays, i I got to cook this hot dog for a minute and 30 seconds? What is? Can't they speed up this microwave anymore? We want it now. We count slowness in a way that's so much different than our Lord. So much different. Such a different perspective. And he says, but he's patient. I'm glad he's patient. Or I might not have had the chance to even be born. But he's patient toward you, not wishing that any, any should perish. The day that Jesus comes for the second time and puts an end to this heaven and this earth, draws a line in the sand. And nobody else gets saved. It's a done deal. If you weren't saved at that moment, you missed it. You've lost it. Do you want that to happen to somebody you love? You know, 
life is rough, right? Right? Life is tough. And you never know when some a friend or a relative, even yourself, might die on the way to work, get in a car accident, or get some terminal illness. It just out of and surprises you and you have three months to live. Or you never know when, you know, you, you're gonna get a big chunk of steak caught in your mouth at the, in, down your throat at Texas Roadhouse and nobody knows the Heimlich maneuver. You never know when these things could happen. The bizarre things of life. Somebody you think is impervious all of a sudden dies within days. You, ne- you know, you never know that. But I don't want to be in charge of making a decision when Jesus comes again. I don't want to be the one deciding when is the best time to just cut the chain. That's it. Anybody that's not saved at this moment in this time is lost. And yet, Christians pray? That, that, that Christian was dead set positive that that the individual was not going to die. Told me right up, I'm not dying. I'm going. I'm being raptured. I'm. I second coming to Christ. I'm like, you do realize that all these people miss out now. That's why I don't know that Jesus is coming back so soon. I don't want to be responsible to make the decision. And He tells us right here, He does not want anybody to perish. Do you think this is going to be a frivolous decision? Now, God knows when that day is. But while there are still hope that someone could be saved, He is not coming again. And I talked about these events in our lives where someone may, may, may die in, suddenly or out of... God is, knows all things. Believe me. If God knew, well, that guy wasn't going to die today. If he had just lived another three weeks, he would have been saved. But he didn't, so he got too bad. God doesn't work that way. He's patient. Anybody who died and went to hell, it didn't matter how much longer they lived, they were never going to accept Jesus. I can promise you that. Because my Lord is patient enough to wait as long as it takes for someone to get saved. Scripture tells me that. So he says, God is not slow. Then he says, He is patient doesn't wish for anybody should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's his goal. And then he tells us in 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. What Peter is telling us is, he's not, just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean God's slow or broke a promise. He knows the date. His idea of time is not our own. This is both a day of splendor and a day of terror. But trust God. He's patient. He doesn't want to bring that day too soon to when if God would have just waited three more weeks, if God would have just waited till tomorrow, another soul could have been saved. Trust me, Jesus is not coming again until He knows, and He knows everything, that if he had left the world out a moment longer, a year longer, a decade longer, a century longer, nobody else was getting saved. He's not going to cut people off that would be saved. Because he's patient enough to wait. What's another thousand years? You mean if I wait another thousand years, another X number of people will be saved? I can wait a thousand years. I'm God. He's not going to do this prematurely. I don't know when it is. I don't know when that day will be, but I don't think we're there yet. I don't see a world where people will not be saved. I have a hope in Jesus Christ that people are still getting saved today. And and as long as people are still getting saved today, this world's not ending today. I wanted to give you another perspective of the end times, another perspective of that day of the Lord. And one more thing I want to leave you with, not every time in Scriptures does the day of the Lord mean the final end days. There are a lot of types and shadows in Scripture where it talks about the day of the Lord and it talks about uh, when God moves against nation or country 
uh, to, to put things right, to, to punish. And we see types and shadows in Scripture where God talks about, Scripture talks about the day of the Lord as a day to bring about correction and punishment against peoples and nations. It's monumental. It's a monumental event that changes the landscape of humanity. That it all is a type and shadow of what is to come in that final day of the Lord. And so when you read Scripture and you see the day of the Lord, ask yourself. For instance, in in Isaiah, on one instance he was talking about the final day of the Lord. In another, uh, he, he was talking about the events of correction that would come about. And the same with, with Amos. They encompass both. But I'm going to leave you with one scripture, a set of scriptures I'll read, and then we'll close out today. And that's Revelations 1 and 7, because you can't really talk about this subject without going there. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And all who was seated on, and, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have his heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That's what we're all looking forward to. Amen. That's that's what we're all looking forward to. I don't see it happening as long as there's somebody else out there that can be saved. Do you want it so badly that you're willing to sacrifice somebody else that you could get there faster? That's not the heart of God. The heart of God is patience. He says, I will will end this world in my time when I have decided, when I know to be true, that no more people will be saved. Because that's what the decision means. Um, And I know that I may be speaking a little bit controversial to many pastors and teachers and Christians who uh, want to say it's coming, but I don't want to be praying for the end of time. I don't want to risk that somebody I love won't make it because of my selfishness to be in heaven. You're better off praying for your own death if you want heaven that badly. But don't pray the rest of the planet into it. Because you might be praying against the will of God, which we talked about in Sunday school, and you may be praying with the, that somebody else would be lost. May we stand today. I know it was a bit an odd message, a bit controversial. But I want you to think and I want you to have a heart that is after what God and Scripture says. A one that that loves life, cherishes life, cherishes the souls of others and puts them above our own needs, our own wants, and our own desires. That we would have the patience as God to wait upon Him knowing the truth in the perfect time. And I hope today's not the day because there are many that could be saved. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for this day, for Your holy and wonderful Word, Lord God. I am so grateful for Your patience. For your patience, Lord, that allowed the years on this earth to pass that I could be here. I'm so grateful that your patience is there so that my children and grandchildren may have, that have life would be here. And, I, and I'm just grateful for your patience and for your wisdom. For on that notable day, on that great day of the Lord, when this earth is done, that it will be done with wisdom and patience and love. Love is the the guiding principle for when this world ends. Lord God, I just, I just trust in you and believe in you, Lord God. For those that are here today, Lord God, we just pray for blessings upon each and every person. We just pray for good tidings this week, for 
for good things to happen in their lives. We just pray for hedges of protection about their homes. For those that are absent, maybe sick or traveling, Lord God, we just lift them up. Lord God, that they would have your protection and that they would feel your presence in this day, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.